good evening. It's lovely to see so many folks this evening to join us to talk about seaweed. There is a lot to say, and we have assembled a pretty incredible panel of folks that know a lot more about seaweed than I do. Um, my name is Naomi Slip. I'm the Chief Curator and Director of Museum Learning here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. And it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to this evening program uh, organized in concert with our current special exhibition, A Singularly Marine and Fabulous Produce, The Cultures of Seaweed, which is an exhibit that we've been working on here at the museum with an incredible team for uh, almost two years. Um, and which is on view until December 3rd. So I do hope if you've come for the program but you haven't seen the exhibit yet, you will take the opportunity to visit it after uh, this wonderful discussion. Um, I would be remiss if I did not thank our presenting sponsors for the exhibition, um, the Bank of America, Susan S. Brennickmeyer, the William W. Wood Foundation, and the Wyeth Foundation for American Art. Um, we also have some wonderful speakers here today who I'll ask to introduce themselves, um, who are, uh, have been generous enough to come and join us to have this conversation. So thank you all for joining us. I'll hand it off to our speakers to kind of go down the line and, and um, introduce themselves and, and tell us what their connection to seaweed is. And then I have a sort of series of questions that I'm going to ask to each of them to respond to. And we'll have um, plenty of time for audience discussion at the end, uh, as well as a reception after. So thanks, everyone, for being here. And let's start off. Steve. Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Kirk. I'm the Coastal Program Director for the Nature Conservancy here in Massachusetts. And um, the Nature Conservancy has a, a pretty involved program around aquaculture and seaweed. Um, and I think we'll get a chance to talk about that uh, through some of the questions. But it's great to be here. I live nearby, and uh, it's always nice to come to downtown New Bedford. I worked on the Ernestina across the street for several years, many, many years ago. So it's like coming home. <laughs> great. Hello. OK, sorry about that. I'm Loretta Robertson. I'm an associate scientist at the Marine Biological Laboratory across the bay in Woods Hole. And I've studied uh, research, I mean, studied re and research in seaweeds um, for most of my career. And, um, and we'll be talking a little bit more tonight about that, hopefully. Good evening, my name is Theo Siskevitz. I am the seaweed scientist and I run the cultivation center at Atlantic Sea Farms, which is a vertically integrated women-led company that partners with seaweed growers throughout the Gulf of Maine um, to harvest seaweed and then turn it into tasty products to sell all around the country. I'm Scott Lindell. Uh, research specialist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution down the road in Cape Cod. Um, I've sort of had a 40-year love affair with uh, aquaculture or, you know, farming waters um, near and far. Uh, started out as a fish farmer some 37 years ago, and I've uh, been working my way down the food chain ever since. Uh, moving to Cape Cod, it was all about shellfish and seaweeds, and. Uh, um, who knows, maybe next we'll be growing uh, microbes. Uh, but I, I, I'm particularly thrilled about this seaweed chapter in my life. It's been the last 10 years or so. Um, just a great, uh, great community. And I, I will share as a, a bit of a preview, thanks to um, Beatrice Oliver, who does all of our special events, uh, that you, if seaweed is not a normal part of your diet, it is a part of the reception catering. So you will be able to get plenty of seaweed uh, in a mouthful after the event. Um, so I'll, I'll ask my, my first question here, and um, I might send it uh, back to you, Scott. Can you describe your current work with seaweed briefly for a lay audience, and tell us what you are most hopeful for as an outcome? Sure. Um, my current work with seaweeds uh, <clears throat> has been lar largely funded by um, the Department of, Department of Energy and uh, most recently by the World Wildlife Fund. Um, those are two very disparate sources of funding, as you can imagine. 
but they're all focused on trying to make <clears throat> the next great change that we need for our society. How do we produce food and fuel and energy and all the, all the sustainable resources we need from low carbon resources? And seaweed is some of the low, lowest carbon intensive resources that we can grow and we can turn it into a whole variety of different products. Um, we'll discuss more later. Um, was there a second part to your question that I haven't answered yet? Uh, I think you hit on that one, what you're most hopeful for. I'm hopeful that that will all come to, to pass in my lifetime. <laughs> all right. Um, Theo? So my job is with Atlantic Sea Farms, and the way I describe it is that I am responsible for our cultivation center, which is basically a nursery. So what we do is we grow all of the baby kelp plants on spools that we then give out to our partner farmers and allow them to grow the next seaweed crop. And really what I'm most excited about is the fact that this industry is taking off. And globally, seaweed cultivation is a 30 billion pound, 35 billion pound industry. But here in the United States, we're just breaking about a million pounds, million and a half. So there's a really long runway and we have a really talented workforce that can transition into growing more seaweed domestically. Yeah, I'll have to uh, agree <laughs> along those same lines. Um, my work has been focused on even lesser studied and known seaweeds. So here in the US, most of the seaweed industry is based in Maine or Alaska. But the warmer tropical waters in the Gulf or in the Caribbean are, are not used or exploited at all. And so my, my work focuses on um, finding new, new cultivars in that region and growing them at a large scale that will impact um, these different industries more sustainably. You know, so the Nature Conservancy is an environmental conservation organization, and um, you know we're working holistically for a world where people and nature thrive. <clears throat> and to do that and reach our goals, we're we're really trying to address the two greatest challenges on the planet, being the climate and biodiversity loss crises. And you know I think there's been a little bit of setup toward the discussion around aquaculture and particularly seaweed, um, I think it's relevant here to, to at least reference that agriculture on land um, has contributed to those crises in a, a not an insignificant way. So thinking about the greenhouse gas emissions that come from growing crops on land to 70% of the uh, fresh water on the planet going to agriculture, 80% of land conservation, uh, land and habitat degradation due to agriculture. Um, growing things can be damaging. And what's really interesting now as we're talking about growing things in the ocean, which is not a new concept, but when we're starting to talk about these lower trophic species like shellfish and seaweed, we're coming at this from the conservation lens in sort of a different way than maybe conservation organizations have approached aquaculture in the past, which was like kind of to try to stop it or to make it less bad. In, in this circumstance, we're, we're really interested in trying to see this inevitable development uh, and influence that and sort of steer the trajectory so it can be most sustainable and, and from an environmental perspective, but ultimately to um, you know, support coastal communities. So my specific work uh, here in Massachusetts is largely around shellfish and less so around seaweed, but the organization is working a lot with you know, even people on the panel here um, to support their work. So I have a kind of um, hopefully a, a fun one, which would be a quick, <laughs> Uh, people are probably imagining seaweed here in its whole form, right? But seaweed is in lots of things, and seaweed is in lots of things that people might not realize. So um, if you all brainstorm things 
that seaweed is used for, things that seaweed is in, and can kind of um, just uh, unmute yourself and, and toss it and just go around a little bit. Um, thanks to Paul Dobbins over here, I'll start us with toothpaste. Ice cream. <laughs> Tennis shoes. Toothpaste, shampoo, <laughs> most of your cosmetics Paper. has seaweed. Something is, <laughs> um, something has just come on the market, still in test form, it are plastic films. Home compostable plastic films. Think about those shirts that you get from L.L. Bean or whatever. They're wrapped in a plastic film that lasts a lot, much longer than the shirt you just purchase probably. But think of how revolutionary it would be if we can readily available get this. And a company called Sway in San Francisco um, has just developed the first kind of commercial prototype for that. That's very exciting. Anyone else? Anyone in the audience want to throw one out there? Yeah, so antiviral, medicinal properties and purposes, yeah. Paint. Paint, all right, yeah. What are the assumptions of using this in food? Where, why is it used? Why? Right. Why is seaweed used in food? Well, I'll toss that to one of our yeah, it's food folks. Well, well, there's sushi, of course, wrapped. Well, it's seaweed. Ice cream. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, so um, parts uh, there, seaweed can be refined into certain colloidal products that are good for thickening. So they're usually used in food processing for thickening agents or um, emulsifying. And then just in terms of the taste as well, is more than just putting it into sushi as well. It's found increasingly in uh, lots of sort of veggie burgers and vegetarian options. There's fermented because you can take seaweed and ferment it the way that you would cabbage, make it into sort of a sauerkraut style or a kimchi style, in addition to the normal seaweed, you know, seaweed salad that you may be familiar with from Asian Japanese restaurants. I was gonna say bull pickles, bull kelp pickles. <laughs> Although one of my favorite products that's made with seaweeds are sort of snack, snacks that you would eat, and it has one of the best names ever. Uh, and they're called chicharrones. So if you've ever had chicharrones, <laughs> pork rinds, these are like chicharrones, but made with seaweed. And they're very tasty and more healthy. <laughs> Fertilizer? Fertilizer, I, yeah. I was going to mention that. You know, these are, these are products, and you know, people here are working on trying to convert it into other things, like biofuels and that sort of thing. But the use of fertilizer, you know, like my aunt still goes and gets eelgrass that washes up on the beach for her garden. Um, and, you know, thinking about that on a more massive scale could have real impact from an uh, agriculture perspective. Great. So, yeah, so wound dressing, bandages, that kind of uh, antiseptic properties, absolutely. What about insulation? Insulation. Thank you, Henry. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And we have some great examples of seaweed insulation in the exhibition. It's a really yeah, popular choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the seaweed I'll, snack. I'll note that that's probably one of the few exceptions of where Americans will eat seaweed just as seaweed. <laughs> Virtually all the other you know, all of their food examples you'll find, for Americans anyway, <clears throat> they're hidden in products that we already are familiar with. And that's the very clever thing that Atlantic Sea Farms is doing in particular, is that they're blending it with foods that we already understand and know and taste and love. Um, and that's part of this transition I think we're going to see, is that if we can produce enough seaweed flour, if you will, milled, it'll replace corn and soy and some of these more carbon intensive and overly, overly grown and depleting our water, fresh water supplies, things like that. Um, that's the way we have to move, I think. That was 
a, I'll turn, I'm repeating the questions just because we're filming in the back here. So alternative uh, to fish oil for, for its um, properties, absolutely. Yeah, nutraceuticals in general are a big source of where a lot of the kelp meal goes. And also fish feed, right, or other animal feeds? Yeah, I was going to make one correction. Seaweeds, at least the kelps, have very little lipid, so there's not much oil value to them. They can, depending on the time of year they're harvested, have a relatively high um, nitrogen, but still pretty low. The real benefit is in the nutraceutical or anti-inflammatory or anti-cancerous qualities that these seaweeds have. Very special ar ar array of micronutrients and microbial products that are, are good for stimulating immune systems especially. So I'd love to transition to ask uh, each of you to share a little bit in your opinion. This I guess gets kind of to the why of your work for each of you um, perhaps. Uh, what is the single most urgent current issue, and that could be environmental, social, political, or economic, that you think is potentially addressed by seaweed? So, Loretta, I'll look to you first. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a big question. I, um, I guess I, I should start off and say that I, I love seaweed, and I think it has uh, a lot of um, hope, and there's a lot of hope and opportunity there, but it's not a silver bullet. That said, I think there's a lot of value that seaweed can bring, um, and it's not just one thing. So um, I would say it's probably the best at, you know, like Scott had mentioned, talking about plastics, that if we can replace the use of fossil fuels, for example, with something sustainable like seaweed, then just that mitigation of, you know, not using that footprint is, is a huge, uh, will be huge for, for the planet. Um, and I'll let, I'll let the others <laughs> comment too. So at Atlantic Sea Farms, we are a mission-driven company and one of the most important parts of our mission is to diversify the fishery and seaweed and kelp farming in particular is brilliant for that because it is a winter crop. And right now we have 5,000 plus lobstermen and that is 70% of the value of all of Maine's fisheries. And seaweed can be grown at the time of year with the same infrastructure, with the same boats, the same ropes, the same buoys that they are already familiar with using. And so it's really a perfect fit where most of the people who are farming kelp are lobstermen, and so this gives them supplemental income in the winter time, and then they get paid in the spring. Coincidentally, right when they have to fix up their traps, pay for all of their permits for every single trap they do, retain their crew, and then buy bait and set everything for their lobstering season. So that's one area where I just am absolutely thrilled to be a part of. Um, <clears throat> the seaweed farming industry in, in the U.S. is so new that we have an opportunity to learn all the lessons that we might have learned from agriculture and do this right, do this sensitively, um, do this with the best science, and that's what WWF is really supporting. Um, and you know, for, uh, give you a quick example. I'm applying these modern genomic tools to classic selective breeding. So it's, we're trying to prove the, 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 the yield of kelp per meter that a farmer plants out there. That's tremendously important to their bottom line and to the bottom line for the processors that are purchasing it and for the consumer who ultimately goes to the marketplace. Because seaweed has to compete with all these other agricultural crops where the price is so low already. Um, so that's, that's one important point. Um, and as I'm doing my genetics and breeding and stuff, we don't want to be breeding monocrops, right? We want monogenetic crops. We've got to keep diversity. We have to be sensitive to uh, the, the wild species that we're also growing kelp around. We don't want to be, we depend on the wild diversity for our selective breeding. 
and we don't want to be, have this transition going back and forth between the farm and the wild, so we have to be worried about or concerned and, and designed for that. Um, I think I'll stop there. Yeah, I think, I think briefly, because we'll have a chance to talk about it more later, but I think there's a tremendous opportunity um, in thinking about the health of our coastal ecosystems and where, particularly in our area, this type of farming would take place is in the near shore, and there are just uh, uh, numerous stressors on these ecosystems, and we're trying to sort of activate all of the potential tools and solutions to combat those challenges, one of them being um, nutrient pollution and too many nutrients making their way to uh, coastal waters and, and the ability for seaweeds to uh, absorb those excess nutrients um, is, is one element in, I think, a suite of ideas and strategies to try and improve coastal ecosystems. And so we're, we're really interested to explore that. Thank you all. Um, can you describe what sustainability means to you in relation to the work that you're doing with seaweed? I'll throw maybe you. So very simply, I think sustainability is if you can keep doing something year after year and not see anything decrease, not see the system collapse. And with seaweed farming in particular, it's a regenerative aquaculture. So we're seeing a lot of our farmers now that have been operating on the same leases for three, four, five years, and they're doing better each year because they're actually getting to be, they're getting it dialed in. But it's a net benefit to the whole surrounding area. Can I ask just for uh, our audience and myself, can you um, explain a little bit what regenerative, regenerative means, particularly maybe in relation to like another sort of traditional crop, like what usually happens versus what seaweed offers? Sure, so with all of the seaweed farming uh, in the United States, when you have the seaweed farm, it's a series of uh, lines attached to buoys and the kelp is growing about five to seven feet below the waves, but there isn't any additional inputs. So it's growing in the ocean, so you don't need to water it. We don't add any fertilizer, you don't add nutrients, herbicides, pesticides, anything like that. As the kelp is growing, it's absorbing some of the nitrogen and other nutrients from the water, and it's, a, it's an autotroph for, for you know, colloquial purposes, it's a plant, and it is the base of the food chain. So it's providing another source of food. And while we try to harvest as much of the kelp as we can, there's always little particles that flake off. And so that's actually adding more food to the coastal ecosystems. And at the same time, it's also providing structure. So this is an area where you see, you know, juvenile fish hanging out as nursery habitat. And so it's basically in the water column creating a kelp bed where there wasn't one before. Yeah, I think this is a, this is a really important point. And I think sustainability is like the term feels a bit diluted now over, over time, but I think that it really does fit well in this context. Um, just the examples given from water quality improvements to habitat for other marine life are, are really, you know, critical components of having a healthy system. And I think this is one tool to do that, to sort of hammer home uh, Thu's comment from earlier you know, also, I think you can think of economic sustainability as well. Um, you know, the, the lobstermen in Maine is one example. You look to some of the other areas even closer to home, you know, from Cape Cod, the islands here on the south coast, it's like harder and harder to live here and work. Um, this is another and new sort of burgeoning industry. There's, I think, some opportunity for economic sustainability that goes along with the uh, environmental components too. I'll just add that one, one component of sustainability that we need to keep in mind is, is to remove that word waste from our vocabulary and, and 
begin to think of things that might otherwise be waste, like say the hold fast on, on the farmer's lines after they're done selling you the product, finding a way to use that and as fertilizer, as some other thing. This is sort of a, a concept that's being held in, in terms of circularity, trying to think of how we can create these circles in all our food and, and manufacturing processes so that there's no waste involved. So that's one thing I don't even think I've told you about. We now have a place for our hold fast. So in <laughs> our next harvest, literally every single part of the kelp thallus, the, the kelp, um, will be put to use. So we're really excited about that, that we can have a zero waste stream product. You heard it here first. <laughs> Great to hear that. Um, I guess I'll, I don't have much, that much additional to add, but uh, maybe talking to the ecosystem services that they mentioned, I think that's a really exciting area for the seaweed industry to think about in terms of how can we bring more value, not just the seaweed itself, but what it does for the environment. So can we get nitrogen credits for removing that extra nitrogen that's getting into the water? Um, can we enhance biodiversity? Um, on our farms in Puerto Rico and Florida, we see lots and lots of juvenile lobster settling and lots of fish, et cetera, and new, new growth around the farm. How can we, um, again, benefit the farmers who are doing this because they're now in areas like the tropics where mangroves and seagrasses have been lost due to water quality issues or development? And those coral reef organisms that need those environments for nurseries, now these seaweed farms could potentially fill in and reconnect these habitats that are essential for the health of those sensitive ecosystems. Um, so I'll, I'll, thinking about this question of kind of the hold fast and a lot of the positive impacts of seaweed, I do also um, want to ask you to uh, describe uh, a single issue that you think is potentially challenging the successes of seaweed farming, whether that's from internally or external pressure. <laughs> I can toss Scott yeah. under the bus. This is your question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, the, the group here knows uh, knows this better than I, so, and I think, I, I have a couple in mind. One being I think that this is a new industry here and that the market demand for the products that are uh, possible um, isn't there and so it's, you know, it's a bit of a um, catch-22 in trying to scale up businesses to fill uh, a market that is um, not quite there yet. Um, another, which uh, again the, the group knows I think better than I, is the, the regulatory scheme and the permitting that's needed to establish a farm like this is, is really rigorous and really challenging. And we, we see this through some of our other work even around things like habitat restoration, um, other aquaculture installations where there are really robust environmental safeguards, which have done great work at, uh, at protecting, you know, sensitive natural resources, and yet um, the same permit that you'll need to, uh, you know, for a department store to put a parking lot on the marsh is the same that you might need to, you know, start a kelp farm or um, try to restore that marsh. And um, so I think that's a, that's a challenging circumstance that I know that this group has run into. <laughs> so you talked about the permitting issues, which is probably the biggest short-term one that we have, where um, new farmers and existing farmers, it can take anywhere between one and three years, or even more than three years, to get a small size lease, and that's time when they have to put in for an application, pay the permit, and then just wait, and they can't utilize that space. Uh, I'd also, sort of stepping back a little bit, say that it involves a bit of a societal change in the way that we think. And so, you know, you go out and you see paintings of Andrew Wyeth of the countryside and windmills and farms and that sort of 
the view that people have of Maine and they think, oh, that's quaint and that's what we want to protect. And then you talk about having sea farms and a lot of people aren't sure what that means. And some people have uh, uh, an initial, no, we can't change anything. You know, we're, we're built on fishing, we're built on lobstering, and we can do more than one thing. And so shifting the mindset from going out and catching lobsters or going out and not having anything at all in our coastal environment to being able to have productive farms is one that we are, are working towards. Yes, um, I think I can add a little bit in terms of the, the permitting and regulation side. One, an additional, uh, or one part, essential part of that is the marine spatial planning. And um, many areas don't really have a good spatial, <laughs> marine spatial use plan, and certainly ones that don't include um, seaweed farming. And so how can we more equi equitably use that space and make sure that everyone is represented and, um, and use, it, use it most effectively. Okay, I'll, <clears throat> I'll bring up the big black whale in the room. <laughs> um, protected species are a big uh, concern among regulators. Um, they have to, the Endangered Species Act is typically uh, referred to in in many of the applications here in New England because right whales and other protected species migrate through areas where we might seaweed farm. And uh, um, fishermen are being tasked to take all their rope out of the water and they rightly say, well, you can't let this, this seaweed farm go ahead and put rope in the water. Um, so there's a lot of pressure to, uh, to consider where does seaweed fit in this. And, there's a couple, couple things afoot to try to understand that risk. First of all, you, you need to understand that um, seaweed farms are very different from lobster lines. You know, lobster lines are loose, they're not tensioned. Seaweed farms are under, under, typically they've gone through some kind of engineering design and are under tension and are like, much more likely to deflect a whale than to uh, entangle a whale. First of all, I mean, another thing is that we, you know, with marine spatial planning, we can understand at least the likelihood of whales going in certain areas. And so we obviously don't want to put it in their feeding grounds. Um, putting a, a seaweed farm in the middle of Cape Cod Bay in the wintertime would be heresy. Um, but we can plan around their timing and their, and their feeding habits. Um, to put things in perspective, uh, with some NOAA scientists, we, we did some calculations of how much seaweed lines and muscle rope lines, which are significant as well, are there in the water any one year? And they would circle the globe about 50 times. And over the last 40 years, we've seen eight entanglements with, eight recorded entanglements, mind you, um, in those kind of aquaculture gear. But every year, with just enough rope to circle the globe seven times, here in the Northeast, Canada and New England included, we, we, we entangle over 30, between 30 and 40 whales. So the risk is so much greater and it's infinitesimal. I will say of those eight whales that got entangled in the last 40 years, four of them died tragically. Many of them in, one, two of them in New Zealand for instance, but the, the rest were, were cut free because that farmers are checking their, their farms fairly regularly. Can you talk about, I believe your lab is working on some new technologies around that? Not my lab, but HUI has, um, mm -hmm. HUI has developed some technologies for being able to spot whales um, that's really going to be revolutionary. It, 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 has, it involves some uh, infrared technology where you, night or day you can tell if a whale is passing through. Thank you. Um, all right. So we've talked uh, about the science of your work, um, some of the implications, some of the questions to consider as we think about seaweed and its futures. Um, 
Would each of you share one of maybe an economic or a cultural or a social impact that you think CME might have beyond the sort of um, immediate applications we've discussed or a longer term? Yeah, an, an interesting project that the Nature Conservancy is involved in um, happens to be in Tanzania. And um, I think it, sort of thinking of this in a, in a cultural and social perspective, I think it's something like 80% of the seaweed farmers are women. And the, um, that coastal community uh, has seen some challenges from, you know, climate change and, and other things. And so um, folks at the Na Nature Conservancy have been working with those women to train them and are sort of trying to improve their practices. I just think it's an interesting um, uh, sort of side, you know, conversation from what we've had to think that, um, you know, this is a this is a coastal community practice and in many parts of the world where responsibilities, you can be close to your family for education and childcare. Um, just a sort of interesting factor that um, a lot of the farmers are women and to try to sort of boost their ability to continue doing this work is something that um, the Conservancy has been really invested in. Kind of along those same lines, um, one of the reasons we're doing work in Puerto Rico is, as many of you know, they um, have a debilitating economic crisis. And it's an island that's surrounded by a lot of marine resources that are completely unused. And so we uh, are hoping that we can help build a seaweed industry there to um, provide an, another source of, of income as well as benefits to the environment. So in Maine, lobster is king. You know That rules the waterfronts and that is the bulk of our landings by value. And I've kind of joked that I would consider myself successful when I heard some of our partner farmers say that they grew seaweed but they lobstered in the off season for something to do. <laughs> and actually in 2012, or 2022, excuse me, we had several of our farmers who made as much or more money growing seaweed as they did lobstering. So much so that one of our partner farmers changed his license plate to read Kelp King. <laughs> well, I think one of the things that um, I'm really intrigued about and, and hopeful about with the seaweed industry that's growing here is that it, it's, um, it, it's almost gender equal. If you look at both East Coast and West Coast, between the processing and the farming, there are a lot of, there's a lot of youthful energy and it's, the gender equity is, is tremendous. I think that means that this industry is, is more collaborative too. That's what I really get out of it. Um, there's a lot more sharing, there's a lot less you know, protectiveness about, well, hey, we're not, we're not competing really against each other. We're competing against king corn and soy and all, you know, all the other, um, uh, byproducts. So uh, that's why it's, it's a great place, great time to be working in this seaweed industry. Just if I can sort of add on that, one of the other really great things that we've noticed is typically with fishing, it's something that the fishermen keep things very close to their chest because they're all going after the same resource. They all want to protect where the best spots are, where they are selling their catch to. And it's a completely different model with seaweed farming where we're actually seeing a ton of collaboration because people have their own lease sites and they know what they're going to have when they sell their crops. So it benefits everyone to have more harvest. And so guys are going, helping out with harvest on other people's boats. They're talking about how do they rig their farms, how do they, get a better production. And so we've gotten to the point now where our more senior farmers are actually taking on the new farmers and helping them become better seaweed farmers. Uh, 
so we've talked uh, a lot about sort of global impacts or kind of um, top level, right, impacts of your research and work. Um, can you talk a little bit, building off of, of Thu's point, about the local or regional role perhaps to play here in the South Coast or, or within New England or around seaweed, in your opinions? I'll throw that to Steve first. I'll, I'll start, just um, <coughs> sort of jumping off where I left, uh, how this is involving you know, youth and energy and women, something that's been missing from the maritime industries in general. So I think this is really a great way to revitalize our working waterfronts, and it is helping in, in, in Maine, certainly. Um, Alaska is beginning to take off, too, in this seaweed farming uh, world. Um, I think I'll stop there. Yeah, I'd say that of the 30-plus partner farmers that we have, I uh, believe all but one live in rural communities. And they are now landing at a time when you really don't see other things coming through. So it's keeping the waterfronts open and working in March, in April, long before the first lobsters of the season are coming in. I think here in New England, we have a real opportunity with the offshore wind industry development. If we think about co-location of seaweed farms or aquaculture in general with offshore wind, um, I think there could be a beneficial relationship in that the seaweed farmers who are, you know, need to stay close to land now could have access to offshore sites. And then these sites can, um, you know, they provide upwelling, potentially cooler water, and um, more habitat and protected areas that could um, benefit those fisheries that feel that they're, they're being lost because of the offshore winds in that place. So, my hope. Yeah, I think, um, I think that there is opportunity in our backyard here, but I also think that there's still sort of quite a long way to go. I, I look to the researchers and farmers here. You know, my understanding from hearing some of the previous work is that you know, certain species are doing well in the Gulf of Maine and some of the pilot uh, research you know, opportunities and things that have gone on in southern New England and Buzzards Bay, Narragansett Bay, like the, the results are so-so. And I think it's part of that opportunity you know, will be realized if the species and the genomics and things of that nature are really well understood. So I think there's there's a bit of an uphill climb to to realize some of these benefits, but um, but I think then you know to unlock that, I think you start to you know have a world where you see the benefits that have all been mentioned here from the environmental, social, um, economic side of things. So Steve just gave me an opening there and, and reminded me that um, we're doing a lot of critical work to selectively breed more temperature tolerant strains because we know <laughs> if you've been in your ocean this summer, the, the oceans are warming up more and more. Um, and the Gulf of Maine is some of the fastest warming waters in, our, in the world. Um, so to, breeding temperature tolerant strains is gonna be really critical to maintaining a, a, a good long breeding a growing season for kelp and, and maintaining yields. Um, so that's really, that's gonna be really important. All right, well, thank you for um, this wonderfully rich discussion. We're coming up on the um, sort of quarter of hour and I did promise some opportunities for questions from the audience. So I think I'll pause here and, and I'm sure we have people ready with, with questions. Um, we've got, I think, some mics that will come around, so if you could uh, wait for a moment for, uh, for the mic so that, again, the, the uh, camera in the back there that can capture, capture your question. So uh, we've got one down here in the front. There you go. Awesome. Hello. How are you all? My name's Adam. I'm a reporter with the New Bedford Light here in town. I have a couple of questions. Um, I mean, you guys touched on the fact that there's a lot of uh, leeway for this market to take off, but I mean, it, we've also heard that about some other crops in the past, I think about like hemp 
and uh, you know, canola <laughs> on land and other, you know, other animals and things in, in the water. I'm just curious as to what, I mean, are you optimistic or how hopeful are you this is, is really going to take off or if it's just gonna kind of stay a niche industry and what, what, what you foresee the future of this looking like? And I also have an, another question too, which is, I mean, obviously biofuels and fertilizer and products of that nature uh, are needed in today's society. Uh, but I mean, how optimistic are you that this will dis that this will uh, displace, you know, uh, corn or uh, you know, uh, soybeans or or other products, plastic even, uh, you know, or once again, will it kind of remain this niche thing? I'm curious to see, you know, what you see the future of that as as well, especially with you know, climate change and things of that right. nature. Well, I think your last point is probably the the biggest pressure point, right? Mm -hmm. Climate change, insurance agents. Um, rising our, raising our premiums because we live near the coast or we're subject to storms, et cetera. All these economic pressures may finally bring a tipping point in our social thinking, our political thinking, that we need to change the way we're, you know, the paradigm we're living in right now. We can't, we can depend on cheap corn and, and cheap soy for a while, but when there's no more fresh water, or the storms are so horrific that we, need, we know we need to do something different with our food system, which is breaking down around us. Um, that's when we'll come to our senses and hopefully you know, price carbon the way it should be priced. And when something as, as low carbon a cost as seaweed is available as a feedstock to replace those things, then the economics will shift. But we also need a political shift as well to make that happen. Because if we wait, for economics to work, which I'm working as hard as I can, as fast as I can to make it more efficient, it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen fast enough in order to avoid some climate catastrophes in the meantime. If I can just address the first part of your question about um, sort of the runway for kelp cultivation in the United States, just to give you a couple numbers. Globally, we're looking at somewhere between 33 and 35 billion pounds of seaweed that are grown throughout the world, and that number is actually increasing every single year. But the second part of this is that in the United States right now, we're growing somewhere between one and two million pounds. Just domestically, our best estimates is that we're consuming about 20 million pounds of seaweed just in the food industry. So 95, 97% of all the seaweed that we eat here is already coming over from Asia. So that's an enormous potential without anyone changing any of their diet. And that also doesn't include all the other uses that we're finding for domestic seaweed, fertilizer, nutraceuticals, um, bioplastics. So we can grow the industry many multiples over without anything changing right now, other than where we're sourcing it from. Hi. I'm gonna ask a question um, not directly related to the edible nature of seaweed. Um, I'm a little bit uninformed about what depths these are uh, grown at. Um, I just did a quick Google and it says at least 50 feet. Can it be shallower? Like, like, what's the depth? That's this isn't my real question. But what depth do these farms occur at? Are they very, very coastal, or are they? So all of the farms are growing. Each farm tries to optimize and find that absolute sweet part for that actual farm. Most farms are finding that's between five and eight feet deep. Okay, so can I from the can, surface? Can I go with that for a second? Okay, so um, my question is. Is there any consideration of um, having a secondary effect of these kelp farms um, in terms of damping waves um, and minimizing coastal erosion as we would see from the land side of the seagrass um, component? I'm just wondering if, that's, if there's a secondary um, impact that they could have um, in the coastal areas. Yeah, definitely. They, um, as they're, especially things like kelps that can get quite large 
any water that's moving past that has, is dragging on that kelp, and that includes waves. And so they, it's definitely been measured on farms in Europe that it does dampen waves that pass over. So that could certainly be one of the additional benefits of seaweed farming. But I, I think that would have to be at a, you know, positioned in such a way and at a scale such that you actually are interrupting waves and doing that in a way that would slow the waves and slow erosion, which at this point, um, my understanding is that, you know, the size and scale of these farms is not going to provide that. What I think is potentially more relevant is as you start to grow in more and more of this, that there are other indirect benefits that can, in some ways, accomplish the same thing. So back to my earlier comment about the excess nutrients, those, you know, the, the um, nutrient pollution causing degradation to eelgrass, to salt marshes that are um, under, con you know, continuing and exacerbated stressors, um, those are incredible carbon stocks and incredibly um, efficient at slowing waves for that very purpose uh, that provides benefits to the community. This is, again, sort of, I think, one additional potential tool that can address the, the problem that way. I've been reading about the purple urchins eating the kelp beds in California, and you haven't talked about any kelp beds in California. Are there predators that would be destroying um, kelp in this area that we need to be aware of? Well, we did have, we do have a cousin to the purple urchin, it's the green sea urchin. Uh, however, we had a very robust and um, overexploited fishery in that in the 80s and 90s, and it wiped out the sea urchins in almost all areas, and they still haven't recovered. So that's the primary herbivore. There is a very tiny snail that's more of a nuisance um, called Lacuna vincta. It gets to be smaller than your pinky nail. At most, it's about a half an inch. And those will come in in waves and sort of chew on the kelp and they're part of the ecosystem, but they're not destroying whole kelp farms or kelp beds. I think one additional opportunity here is that if you have an industry and um, people that are farming with the experience and the infrastructure to grow the native species in our area, there's the potential to leverage that experience and infrastructure to um, restore the natural habitat. And so we have examples of this in the shellfish world, um, you know, farmers becoming habitat restoration practitioners. Um, there's opportunity and examples of this going on in the seaweed world as well. Um, I'm wondering, um, when will we see a local outlet for consumers to purchase raw seaweed for cooking, um, what varieties would we see and what would the price point be? Would we be seeing, how soon before we'd see them at farmer's market? So I can't say about farmer's markets because those are all individually run, but we are selling in about 2,000 grocery stores right now, including Whole Foods in the area here and Hannaford's throughout Maine. And so you can find um, what we call our ready-cut kelp. It's just ready to eat, um, been processed and shredded in freezer sections, and then fermented kelp, seaweed salad um, in the refrigerated case already. Thu, isn't there a store in Portland that is dedicated to just selling seaweed stuff? The Heritage, Heritage yes. House? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Consider the Heritage House, too, as a one-stop shop. So apologies if I get anything wrong here, but um, my understanding is we're mostly talking about macroalgae, which is seaweed, but there's also microalgae that plays a role in some of these applications we've been talking about. And I was wondering if you could discuss the pros and cons of each, depending on the context. Sure, I, I pursued a, a microalgae to 
biofuels program for four or five years with some colleagues at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, very tough nut to crack, uh, largely because um, it's very difficult and very energy intensive to remove water from microalgae. It's pretty easy with seaweed. You just hang it up and it evaporates. But you can't, you can't really hang up a microalgae. It just, it just runs away and dissolves. Um, so that's been one of the principal drawbacks in the energy in, in trying to produce microalgae. Um, and most microalgae uh, have to be grown on land. Uh, so you've got a capital, you have a much higher capital expense. It's often done in the desert where there's not a lot of fresh water to begin with, but they try to use some saline waters that, uh, um, to make it a long story short, um, ExxonMobil has spent over half a billion dollars trying to produce biofuels from microalgae. And it's only in the last year or two, and, and, and almost 15 years, it's only in the last year or two they've decided that they probably should pivot to something else as far as bio, for biofuels is concerned. There have been some successes growing microalgae to produce other products, other things that those um, very special long-chain fatty acids or lipids can be used for. Everything from a uh, 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 supplement for breastfeeding milks um, to cosmetics and uh, special, special lubricants and the like. Hi, I'm wondering about um, research that's being done about toxic algal blooms that um, I know there are colossal ones that happens on the beaches in France, but also in the US and the South, where you get all kinds of runoff from farms um, and then fish die off and you know the beaches are unusable and people and animals even die from going where the, where the, um, the algae is rotting. And I'm wondering, is, is there ways in which uh, seaweed or kelp farming can counter those effects, or um, are, are they related in any way? So the things that allow toxic algae blooms, which is just microalgae, to really grow out of control are excess nutrients concentrated in one area. And you start with small, and then it's just exponential growth and then they wind up just stripping all the resources. So having a healthy ecosystem to begin with and having kelp in the area or seaweed in the area that's taking up that nutrients and not allowing them to get overly high is a very powerful way of avoiding those harmful algal blooms in particular. And on a related note, we already have a standard where all of the seaweed farms are grown in the same zones that are monitored and approved for shellfish growing, which one of the main concerns they have is for to toxic algal blooms. And so we're growing the seaweed in areas where you're not likely to see that for that reason. I was just going to add that for at least some tropical species, so not the kelp, but they've been found to deter growth of some of the harmful algal species. So, for the Just research. to quickly point out that that doesn't happen only in Florida and tropical areas. The beach in my town, two towns over, was closed for that very reason. Right, I'm wondering, uh, like m my limited understanding of these things, it's often related as well to temperature in some ways. So the work that you're doing in your lab, does, um, is there any way in which kind of the discoveries or the, the efforts that you're making might have links there? In relation to the toxic algae or just in generally just thinking about the ways in which sort of um, Ocean temperatures are impacting the yeah. kinds of uh, <clears throat> things that are. Yeah, no, exactly. Developing. I mean, that's that's you know one of the reasons why I decided to work with tropical species because the planet is warming, the ocean is warming, and these species are already adapted to those types of environments. And so, um, even some of the species that we work with, Gracilaria, they are found from the Caribbean all the way up to here. It's just in the winter time up here they die out, um, and so. Um, Definitely, there's more opportunity. Right now, I think we're growing 
mostly maybe eight species of seaweed when there are thousands of species out there that we know so little about. Um, in reading um, the article in the New York Times, I think it was, um, it seemed to say that there was a lot of opportunity for economic um, benefit from harvesting seaweed. And I just feel that we have not held back on harvesting all of our resources on land and off also the fish in the ocean. So I wonder if there is potential for over-harvesting the seaweed. I think it's a really interesting question and something that uh, my colleagues have been thinking about a little bit as you potentially increase demand for some of these seaweed species, they become readily available from a farm setting. Um, there are existing wild harvest uh, for seaweed that are going on now and I, I think it's, a, it's an astute question to think about, you know, altering demand such that you could, um, you know, put further pressure on wild harvest. I think just to be cognizant of that and you probably have to involve the, you know, the regulating community into, into decision making to protect what we have. Yeah, I'd add that there are vigorous wild harvesting kelp and other seaweed industries around the world. Um, at, certainly, at least in the developed world, they're very well managed. They're, they're quite restrictive. And for instance, Norway is one of the larger places for harvesting kelp. Uh, but that, isn't, that hasn't stopped the interest and the development of seaweed farming in that region because they can't harvest enough to, su well, to supply their industrial um, needs. And the farmers can't grow it cheaply enough to supply industrial needs yet, but they're all they're already looking, you know, to the next generation of how are we going to get there, and that's why some of our collaborative work across the Atlantic is really important because we're trying to do the very same thing. How do we develop a farming industry that can be economically sustainable as well as environmentally sustainable? Great. Well, we're just at the top of the hour here. We have a reception to look forward to where we can continue this conversation over seaweed snacks and <laughs> uh, refreshment. Um, I would also uh, encourage folks, again, if you haven't been into the exhibit, to see it. So I'd love to toss one last question to our <laughs> panelists here, um, which uh, may not be fair. Hopefully, everyone got a chance to pop into the exhibit beforehand. I won't make everyone answer. But uh, if you have a favorite work in the exhibition that you want to make sure uh, our audience uh, takes a peek at, if you wouldn't mind sharing. My, mine was the quilt. My, my uh, mother-in-law was a great quilter and left us with many uh, wonderful Cape Cod quilts before she left this world. And uh, that just kind of evoked um, the kind of colors and, and scheme that she would, she would have loved and I loved too. I was really excited to see the Andrew Wyeth painting that's there, which is entitled Lobster, but if you look closely at it, the majority of the painting is actually seaweed surrounding a lobster. <laughs> Um, I, I know it's, it's kind of cheating, but the Seaweed Gatherers painting is so stunning and so vibrant. And it just reminds me of how uh, times have changed where seaweed obviously was a really big part of people's lives. And now we know so little about it. And hopefully that will start to change back um, for us. Yeah, I'll do a little shameless plug um, in that my colleagues helped provide some of the information that was brought into the exhibit. And so as you go in on the right-hand side, there are several panels that talk about much of what was talked about tonight. So I encourage you to take a look at that. But I'll have to second, and, and I think what sparked Naomi's um, interest in like the crown jewel of the exhibit really is just that. It's, a, it's very big, it's dramatic, uh, it's an incredible artwork.
Wonderful. Well, thank you all. I will uh, take that opportunity to note that if you've enjoyed this seaweed program, there is more to come, including a program in early October where another roundtable uh, with different participants will sit down and talk about the culture and history uh, of seaweed, particularly focusing on the art uh, and material culture. So that'll be a fun one to keep an eye out for. But for now, um, please join me in welcoming this incredible group of panelists, and thank you to all of you for coming. Thank you.